My name is John Bolton. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a planning and zoning commissioner in Westport, have been since July of 2021. I am a father and I am a candidate. And I'm asking you to keep an open mind tonight and listen to everything I have to say between now and November 5th. Because what I've learned as a planning and zoning commissioner is that on the very, very local level, there's a lot of differences between the parties. What experience or qualifications distinguish you to, to serve in the Connecticut legislature? I have been practicing law for 34 years, and one of the most essential elements of what I do for a living is to communicate, and to communicate clearly. And one of the things that I really believe in is bilateral government, and that means there should be an interplay between what goes on here locally and what goes on with our state representatives up in Hartford. Being on zoning, and I'm sure there's some people that may not agree with me, but zoning sees everything in this town. Zoning's the gatekeeper. And what I have learned is that communication between what's going on here and what's going on up in Hartford, first of all, is lacking right now, and it needs to be amplified. This town has an amazing story to tell, especially when it comes to affordable housing. I think this town is beyond unique. It's beyond generous, and it's beyond progressive and forward thinking. That story's not being told. Now, I have the unique perspective, have being raised, born and raised in West Hartford, Connecticut, and moving here in 1997. I understand both parts of the state. Whether you guys want to admit it or not, there's an iron curtain that descends on the state of Connecticut somewhere around the Sikorsky Bridge, or between the Tunnel New Haven and the Sikorsky Bridge. There's New York, Connecticut, and there's New England, Connecticut. I understand both sides of that. And I believe that there needs to be more bilateral government where there is more of a presence in this town of our state representative to tell our story up in Hartford because it's an amazing story and we get no credit for that and that's very upsetting to me. Everything that we're doing on zoning right now keeps me up at night that it's going to get undone if we lose local control. Period. And I'm going to tell that story and I'm going to advocate for this town and let everybody know how Westport has been way ahead of the curve on these kinds of issues. I just want to respond to my, uh, my opponent's statement about Hartford not knowing about Westport's success story in affordable housing, clearly he has not been paying attention. I have testified before the committee about affordable housing. I have brought our former PNZ commissioner, Danielle Dobin, to testify before the committee. She has also, along with I, worked on shaping legislation from Work Live Ride to the uh, Fair Share Bill, which we managed to defeat based upon a coalition that I put forward. So. I assure you, Hartford knows full well what Westport is doing about affordable housing. Maybe my opponent needs to find that out, too. Your opponent knows very well what's going up in Hartford. Your opponent's been on planning and zoning for three years, and not once have I ever been briefed by you at a subcommittee meeting or at a uh, executive session meeting, or not executive session, work, work session meeting on zoning in three and a half years. Have, had it not been for our good work here locally to keep up what's going on in Hartford, we never know what's going on. That story is not being told in Hartford because there is a stereotype, and I'm going to say this very clearly, Westport's affluence divorced elitism over 40 years ago. I'll say it again. Westport's affluence divorced elitism 40 years ago. Again, i just like to correct the record. Uh, my opponent is fairly new to the Planning and Zoning Commission, so he doesn't know the long history of our conversations with planning and zoning. Uh, I've had any number of conversations with the chair of the Planning and Zoning Commission, Paul Leibowitz, his predecessor, Daniel Dobin, with members from both sides of the aisle, including Kathy Walsh. So uh, this has been an ongoing story, which he may be relatively new to, but we've been talking affordable housing in Westport for some time, and we've brought our successes with ADUs, with middle housing, cluster housing, forward so that others can benefit from our model. I agree with um, CC about the fact that the state does have a lot of issues that we're facing. I'll just give you a couple right off the top of my head. Public safety is a major issue, and this town experienced in the last 18 months some acts of crime that I never thought I'd see in Westport. I'm talking about home invasions, uh, carjackings, smash and grabs at Lux Bond downtown, broad daylight on a Friday. Mm -hmm. These are things that we need to start worrying about because we used to think, or we did believe that that was over there. Well, over there is now over here. And when we have things like the Police Accountability Act that's passed, for something that happened 1,426 miles away, I have to wonder why we even did something like that. That's designer legislation. We have to do away with that kind of stuff. A super, let, let me put it this way, a perennial majority of one party 
always tends to produce legislation that has good intentions but with unknown consequences. A supermajority produces bad legislation with intended consequences, and that's where the state is careening. And we have to stop that. We have to stop that now. Otherwise, we'll be a one-party state. The second issue, of course, is education. Our kids are our only guaranteed immortality. And our ability to educate them properly and to compete in this world is probably the single most important thing we're going to do as politicians and government officials. There's no higher duty than what we owe to our children because we have to leave them better than the place that we found. Um, and then, of course, the big issue in the big pink, pink elephant in the corner is affordable housing. And as much as I've been hearing the talk about the affordable housing, there's been no change in 830G. My law professor, my property professor in law school wrote 830G at the time I was there. Mm -hmm. What it's being used for now is the point of a bayonet, okay? It's not to increase talent to live in the state of Connecticut and it's been co-opted. So those are three major issues that really threaten the state of Connecticut's ability to compete. Uh, anyone like to have rebuttal? No? I do, okay. actually. I don't understand how we can have both Westport as a model that Hartford needs to know about on affordable housing and also then the issue around 830G because Hartford, I mean, Westport is doing such a good job and has planned for affordable housing. So it, it's two different things that don't, don't make sense to me. Anyone else rebuttal? Oh, I, can I ask for clarification on that last statement? What, what doesn't make sense? Well, just your statement before that A30G is a problem, but yet you also hold Westport up as a remarkable place for hard work. Because Westport has acted well before 830G came into effect. Okay, hold on, court. hold on. Yep. So I'm if sorry. you're done and with your rebuttal, and I think you're probably I done am. on yes. time, uh, you're welcome to a 30 second rebuttal. No, it's fine. I, I, Westport has been well ahead of 830G. Westport's been doing things with regard to affordable housing well before the bayonet of 830G came into effect. That's my point. And the fact, that the, fa the fact that Westport doesn't get any type of dispensation from moratoriums or counts, for example, Hales Court or Canal Street doesn't count as affordable housing because it was built before a certain period of time, that's something that should have been done a long time ago by the representatives from here. I'm sorry, but that's Next fact. question is, do you support the proposed amendment to the Connecticut Constitution to allow absentee voting um, for any reason, otherwise known as no excuse, uh, why or why not? I believe that this is brought before uh, the electorate with good intentions. The problem is that when you have something that's blanketed, no excuse voting or absentee voting, I think it opens up uh, the possibility for a lot of abuse and a lot of voter fraud. And while I believe that there are a ton of people who legitimately can't vote on November 5th for whatever reason, I think that there needs to be far more well-defined guardrails on how this absentee voting uh, no excuse would be implemented. So you never, ever block anybody from going to the ballot box, ever. But you also have to be careful because voting is probably one of the most sacred things we get to do as citizens. And so you don't want to do anything to make legislation that while on the face of it looks nice and it looks like it's advancing the cause of democracy, could open the door to abuse down the road. And that's my big concern because obviously that's been an issue for the last 10 years in this country. There's a lot of people on both sides of the aisle that feel that the um, voting process has been somehow marginalized or diluted uh, by virtue of either pandemics or local legislation or whatnot. And so we gotta be really careful when it comes to that. And so I don't necessarily uh, uh, agree to have an open-ended, no excuse policy. I don't think there should be no excuse policy for just about anything. I totally disagree with my opponent that this is something that we agree on both sides of the aisle. There could not be a more divisive issue when it comes to partisan politics. Democrats believe that if you're eligible to vote, you should vote. Republicans do not. They believe in voter fraud because it's the only way they can institute voter suppression efforts. They keep certain people they don't want voting from voting. This is really not America. This is not our democracy. 
Now, Connecticut is behind most other states because we've enshrined our voting laws in the Constitution rather than through statute. It's much more difficult to change. We have to do a ballot initiative and a referendum with the people. I encourage everybody to take a good look at this initiative and then support it. I'm really, really tired having heard this argument for years and years, these mealy-mouthed uh, uh, exceptions to, to how the law might play out in some fashion, which just never happens. Voter fraud is negligible to non-existent. I'd like to rebut to the comment that the Republicans are known for voter suppression because they don't want people to vote who they don't like. That is nonsense, and you know it. And there is no evidence that you could bring to this table tonight, to this day is tonight, that suggests that. And I resent that comment because there is nothing to suggest that the Republican Party, who's in the minority in the state, has used any leverage whatsoever to suppress the vote. All I'm simply stating, and I'm not mealy mouth, by the way, is that if voting is a right, but it is also a privilege, it's a privilege of living in a democracy. Thank you. And simply stated, if you're not going to vote on time, you should have a reason for that. The only thing that you really need to know is that there really isn't voter fraud. It's made up. It's at best episodic with a couple of bad players. To continue to harp on voter fraud as a justification for limiting access to the vote is wrong. Affordable energy is a significant issue for Connecticut and Westport as reflected in the large Eversource increase. What is the legislature doing to make energy prices more affordable? What other things will you support in this effort? I understand what happened in 2017 with the a deal that uh, required the um, purchase of uh, energy from Millstone. The problem is that go tell Mrs. So-and-so, who's a 67-year-old widow in Southington, well, we thought it was a good idea at the time. That's not good enough. When you're a legislator, and you're a seasoned legislator, 14 years, you should have some prescience, and you should have some ability to look into the future and figure out what possible unintended consequences could be happening. How nobody could see this coming down the road is unacceptable. I don't believe it. I don't buy it. It's more than it was just a good idea or we thought it was a good idea at the time. That's a direct quote of my opponent. It wasn't a good idea, obviously. And so the issue is you don't now all of a sudden, for example, with the RWA, go to a public-private entity, mm -hmm. which is very inefficient. I've had litigation with both. You're from Trumbull. WPCA was overcharging for years because there weren't proper controls on this. There's no accountability when you have a regional authority like that. In that area, that's where private enterprise is best served uh, by keeping it with a private entity. But the fact of the matter is, I don't want to hear any more. We're working on it. Okay, 14 years, you want real change. Real change from what, your 14 years? Real change from your time? No, we want to see some results now. And it's very simple. I'm not asking anybody to have a crystal ball. I'm not the smartest guy in the room, okay? I don't have every plan. I don't have every resolution or solution to a problem. But you gotta start thinking outside the box and start instead of going with this fad designer legislation that looks good on the front page. And that's the problem. No one's thinking beyond down the road. 10, 12, 15 steps down the road. And who's paying for it? You are. Every single one of you here tonight. And that's going to stop.